Today we're going to go over the indications for deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism prophylaxis for hospitalized surgical patients as well as uh, chemoprophylaxis for GI ulcers for surgical patients. This video is going to go over chemoprophylaxis for things like DVTs, PEs, and gastrointestinal ulcers. From a surgical perspective, uh, all patients are candidates for uh, DVT prophylaxis unless they're very, very low risk. Um, but I'm really not going to talk about those categories right now. Two different options, Lovenox uh, and uh, Heparin. You can either give the Lovenox uh, starting two hours before surgery or day of or day after, uh, as long as the patient isn't a bleed risk. You know, if it's a patient that had big liver resection and they're hypotensive, uh, tachycardic post-op, you probably hold off. Um, for patients with low creatinine clearance, uh, you would use just 30 milligrams daily. Uh, when patients are getting their epidurals out, you want to hold the Lovenox at least for 12 hours before you take the epidural out and then restart it uh, two to eight hours after the epidural's out. Uh, heparin, you can either use 5,000 units every t uh, eight or 12 hours. It's less expensive, um, a little bit. Uh, it doesn't work quite as well as the Lovenox, but it's an option as well. Uh, and you hold that six hours before, restart eight hours after the epidural. So you have to watch out for HIT. Uh, you can uh, usually it starts within the first five to ten days after a patient's been on heparin or Lovenox. Um, there's a 4T score you can look up. Uh, if a patient has a moderate or uh, high probability on the 4T score, you want to get a screening for HIT. First, you use the heparin induced platelet antibody test. Uh, costs a couple hundred bucks, probably like two or three hundred bucks. Very sensitive, it gets the results back quickly. Uh, it's also a semi-quantitative test, so a uh, optical density less than 0.4 pretty much rules out HIT. If you have a weak positive, you want to get a, con a confirmatory uh, serotonin release assay, which is um, one of the, uh, it's kind of a gold standard, not official, but a lot of people consider it gold standard. Uh, if your optical density is greater than 1, it's strong positive, and you would either uh, decide to treat for heparin-induced uh, Thrombus, uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or you could get a serotonin release assay uh, if you want. Those are your two options. Any patient with uh, medium or high risk uh, pretest probability, you probably want to treat for HIT with therapeutic anticoagulation, uh, unless they, uh, um, uh, unless there's any reason not to. Uh, with HIT, you're really worried about the uh, platelet uh, aggregation and thrombosis. The bleeding tends to uh, not be as much of an issue despite the fact that these patients do get low platelet counts. Serotonin release assay, uh, pretty 90% uh, sensitive and specific. You get the results back in probably two to seven days. Um, you don't always have to order it and it's also more expensive than the heparin induced platelet antibody test. Uh, the serotonin release assay is probably about uh, twice as much. I'm not sure what the actual hospital or patient cost is but it's somewhere on the order of like three to six hundred dollars, whereas the heparin-induced uh, platelet antibody screen is on the order of uh, maybe two to four hundred dollars. Um, but also, you know, your the anticoagulation you're going to be using will be pretty expensive, maybe uh, five hundred to a thousand bucks a day if you're using like ergotriban or something like that. So it's good to get these tests quick so you can uh, take patients off those uh, alternative anticoagulations. Uh, they also have a uh, higher risk of bleed, so you want to get these tests uh, done quickly so you can treat the patient appropriately. And if they don't have HIT, you can put them back on heparin or Lovenox. Next up, GI ulcer prophylaxis. Uh, there's different, uh, pe people use different criteria, but uh, basically what I've read and uh, most of the information that I uh, uh, look is going to be from Marino right here, which I showed you in the previous book. Uh, video. So basically two major, one minor uh, indication. The major ones, uh, sorry, one major, two minor. If a patient takes an H2 blocker like Pepsid or Protonix at home, you want to give them, uh, put them on GI ulcer chemoprophylaxis, uh, intubated for more than two days if they're coagulopathic, if they've had a GI ulcer or bleed, um, brain or sc spinal cord injury, burn, then the minor ones, if they've been in the ICU, if they've had a GI bleed, um, if they're on steroids, hypotensive, uh, severe sepsis, renal or hepatic failure, uh, you want to you want to use these uh, 
uh, GIL superfluxes. So it, it'll end up being about uh, about 70 or 80 percent of all your surgical patients. Um, your options are uh, protonics. You can give it IV. This is the best and most expensive. If a patient's actively having a GI bleed, you want to put them on a uh, a uh, uh, PPI drip or at least protonics 40 milligrams uh, twice a day but for prophylaxis 40 milligrams IV daily is fine um, Pepsid uh, less expensive option this would be best for patients that are uh, that need uh, prophylaxis but aren't really really high risk for GI bleed like they haven't had a GI bleed before if a patient had a GI bleed before you probably want to go with the protonics it works a little better um, for patients with uh, with uh, low creatinine clearance or estimated GFR, you want to do just the Pepsid once a day. Then for patients taking PO, you want to switch them to uh, Pertonix PO because they'll be less expensive. So that's all for now, and I'll try and give you a big uh, screenshot of the whole sheet in case you want to uh, make yourself a nice printout. There you go. That's all for now.